Happy Solar Eclipse Day, everybody. That is right. The moon is going to cock block the sun, block it out for a few minutes at 3.30, and everybody is very excited about it. Everybody but the birds. I don't know. Anyway, there was an earthquake over the weekend. I hope that you survived. We will rebuild New York. Thank you very much for joining me on today's episode of Stand Up, where each and every day I give you a comprehensive recap of the day before's news, along with usually audio clips, all from Earth One, some from Earth Two. And then I almost always interview a very smart expert, author, journalist, scholar, scientist, and often artists, comedians, etc. Somebody who generally really knows what they're talking about or is fascinating and good at talking. And today I've got a first timer, very excited to have Helene Olin joining me for the first time. She's an author, a journalist, writes about personal finance and exposes the dark side of it, has a great new piece at MSNBC.com where she's a contributor about the minimum wage increase in California. We had a great conversation that begins at 28 minutes today. But you don't want to miss today's news update. So let's get it started, shall we? Remember, I cannot do this daily podcast without your support. Sign up now for a paid subscription. It is fully funded by you, independent journalism and media that you can trust. How's that? Is that a good slogan? Do you believe that? Are you buying that? Well, thank you, everybody. You can maybe tell my voice is still a little bit scratchy. I still got a little bit of the linger of the COVID, but thank you to all of those of you who continue to reach out almost every day. I'm good. I've always been, it hasn't been too bad, but you can hear it a little bit. My voice, hopefully it's not too annoying because I got a lot of news to mention here on the recap from Earth One. And let's start with news about the eclipse. Here is Katrina Miller in the New York Times. On April 8th, North America will experience its second total solar eclipse in seven years. The moon will glide over the surface of our sun, casting a shadow over a swath of Earth below. Along this path, the world will turn dark as night. Sky watchers in Mexico will be the first to see the eclipse on mainland. From there, the show will slide north, entering the United States through Texas, then proceeding northeast before concluding for most people off the coast of Canada. Why do eclipses happen? Well, the moon comes between us and the sun, but they're also complicated. The most important thing to remember, never safe to look directly at the sun during an eclipse, except for the few moments when the moon has fully obscured its surface. At all times, watch the event through protective eye equipment, and that's all I'm going to tell you about it, because I think if you're interested, you're probably nerding out. You probably know a lot more, and if you're not, maybe that's enough. I don't know. Either way, i got to move on to other headlines. I look forward to seeing all your pictures and hearing about all your experiences as you burn the rods and cones out of your pupils. The other big news story yesterday we woke up to was that the Israeli military announced it's pulling troops out of of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza that has been a target of Israeli operations. The latest update on Israel's ongoing military invasion comes six months to the day after the surprise attacks led by Hamas on October 7th that sparked the ensuing conflict. Around 1,200 people were killed during the attacks, Israeli officials say, and more than 250 hostages were taken to Gaza. Around 130 hostages remain there six months later, some whom are known to be dead. Israel's subsequent military campaign in Gaza has killed more than 33,000 Palestinians, according to Gaza health authorities, mostly women and children. Children, mostly women and children. The war has leveled infrastructure, displaced many of the two million Palestinians living in Gaza and caused widespread hunger. On Saturday, tens of thousands of demonstrators took the streets in Israel to protest the inability of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government to secure the release of the remaining hostages. A new round of talks is set to reach a potential ceasefire to take place in Cairo yesterday, and I'm sure I'll have more on that tomorrow. But the big news, Israel Army pulls out of Khan Yunus in southern Israel, announcing that it's concluded its mission. The division left the Gaza Strip in order to recuperate and prepare for future military operations, according to the Israeli military in a statement. So that is the big news and update from the Middle East. Of course, the fallout continues over the killing of those humanitarians. I'll have some more audio on that coming up. What else do I have for you? Uh, the South Carolina women's basketball team defeated the Iowa women's basketball team in the women's NCAA basketball championship. They went undefeated for the season. It's a pretty inspiring story. Women's basketball basketball put on the map this year in a big, big way. And I think that's a really good thing for women, for sports, for our culture. And that's all I'll say about that because I don't really do a lot of sports here. But I was pretty excited to watch some of the games over the weekend. What else do I have for you in politics? House Speaker Christian Nationalist, the embattled House Speaker now, has pledged to bring up Ukraine aid for a vote in the House soon after Congress returns from Easter recess in the coming days. But what will the bill look like and who will support it remains unsettled due to the fractures among Republicans and Democrats over both aid for Ukraine and related assistance for Israel. But Mike Johnson preparing to unwrap the mystery Ukraine aid package is the headline at the Wall Street Journal. 
Here's an unsettling headline as well. Man arrested for setting fire outside Senator Bernie Sanders office in Vermont. A man accused of setting a fire outside the senator's office in Vermont earlier this week has been arrested. The suspect previously from Northern California was recorded on security video spraying liquid near the door of Sanders office in Burlington, then lighting the area with a handheld lighter. Incident unfolded early Friday. Guy sounds like a real smart fella and uh, probably has some problems. Glad there were no injuries, but uh, still always a terrible and should always be mentioned when these kinds of things happen, no matter who they happen to, if they are in elected office. More and politics from the disgraced former president, apparently, and it's really difficult to independently confirm this, but I will say it, New York Times and others reporting that billionaire hedge fund manager and total asshole John Paulson hosted a fundraiser for the disgraced former president and many times indicted rapist Donald Trump at his mansion in Palm Beach, Florida, right down the road from Mar-a-Lago. And apparently they raised like $50 million, like the suggested donation was $800,000 but the, I think the minimum was $250,000 and a whole bunch of billionaires apparently came. The headlines were that at the event, the disgraced former president said that he wants immigrants from nice countries like Denmark. Oh, and speaking of immigration, there was some news on Friday about the border. The number of migrants apprehended along the U.S.-Mexico border dipped in March. Internal government statistics obtained by CBS News apparently show a surprising trend that American government officials say mainly stems from an immigration crackdown by the Mexican government as influenced and enforced by the U.S. government. So I guess that's good news, but that won't stop people from lying about it. And the crisis in Haiti is terrible. Heavily armed gangs control apparently 80 percent of the capital city, Port-au-Prince. The United Nations has estimated where they are committing the worst types of crimes with impunity. Haiti doesn't manufacture firearms and the U.N. prohibits importing them, but that's no problem for the criminals when they go shopping in the United States is their gun store, according to reporting from The Washington Post titled When Haiti's Gangs Shop for Guns, the United States is their store. Of course, I just interviewed and talked with Aeva Usenite about this and her new book, Exit Wounds, How America's Guns Fuel Violence Across the Border. And it's a perfect distillation of how that works, as terrible as it is. How about this one? While Republican lawmakers try to walk a fine line on in vitro fertilization, expressing support for the popular procedure, even as some of their supporters argue life begins at conception, the federal government under Democrats and President Biden expanded fertility benefits for millions of workers this year, including up to $25,000 a year for IVF. And those are the things that I've got for you for headlines from the weekend. Coming up this week, of course, the total eclipse today, Muslim holiday, Eid al fatir which marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan expected to begin this week. The House of Representatives, led by Christian Nationalist Republicans, expected to deliver impeachment articles against the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on Wednesday. The Senate will likely quickly dismiss them, and that'll be a political stunt. South Korea will hold parliamentary elections on Wednesday. President Biden is hosting a leaders' summit on Thursday with the Prime Minister of Japan and the President of Philippines. Coachella begins on Friday, and tonight is the NCAA Men's National Championship, pitting Purdue do against a UConn, the University of Connecticut. And I know nothing or won't talk about college basketball or sports here on the podcast, but I do watch it and I will just make one observation. Each one of these teams has a very large, monstrous man at the center position uh, that both of them, their combined height of these two centers is 250 feet. They're just giants. Just tune in to watch how big these guys are and how long their arms are and then laugh and remember that I told you about the two giants on these two teams if you happen to tune in. All right, go Purdue or UConn. I really don't care. But if you do, good luck. I hope you win. Those are your headlines. I've got a ton of audio that I want to share with you from the weekend, and we'll end on some laughs from the boys at Saturday Night Live's weekend update, as I often do on the Monday show. And I like to start and get these clips from Crazy Town out of the way. Let's head over to Earth 2 and see what they were saying on Fox News, where the anchor of Fox News' media buzz, Howie Kurtz, confronted a spokesperson for the disgraced former President Donald Trump on why Trump has been comparing himself to Nelson Mandela. This is a fun one minute. I'm a little short on time, but let me ask you about uh, Trump writing this about Judge Juan Merchan in the hush money trial. If this partisan hack wants me to put wants to put me in the clink for speaking the open, obvious truth, I will gladly become a modern day Nelson Mandela. It will be my great honor 
So why is he comparing himself to Mandela? And is he now worried about going to jail in this case? No, not at all. Truth will ultimately prevail in this case and in all of the cases. The Democrats want President Trump confined to a courtroom. Unfortunately, he'll have to be on trial in a dirty New York City courtroom because Alvin Bragg is a far left district attorney who has spent more time persecuting President Trump than prosecuting real violent criminals on the streets of New York. President Trump is exposing the truth in all of these Biden led Mm -hmm. witch hunts. And that's exactly why you see these gag orders coming down. Not only are they prosecuting him, but they want to silence him. It's a complete violation of his First Amendment rights. Right. Well, he could still talk about the case, but I'm glad to have your response on that. Carol. All right. Well, how about this? Here's Bishop Talbert Swan reacting to that on Twitter. He says, imagine a racist miscreant like Donald Trump claiming that going to jail for contempt of court is equivalent to Nelson Mandela going to prison for fighting the racist system of apartheid. The caucasity of this vile, demented bigot. Richard Stengel writes, Nelson Mandela was a prisoner of conscience for violating unjust laws, discriminated against his people. Trump has violated dozens of just laws for his own self-interested purposes. Mandela never even called his jailers unflattering names. Trump calls immigrants animals. Mandela fought for the freedom of people in what Trump calls shithole countries. To even compare the two is in obscenity. All right. Well, some reaction to Trump comparing himself to Mandela and outrage. And I like it. I'm here for it. Now, here's another clip from Fox News. This is Kevin McCarthy talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene as a serious legislator. Later, and I thought it was kind of funny and also horrifying. I think they made a mistake by not funding Israel earlier. I would utilize it. We have the ability to help Ukraine with no American troops. That's what's been happening. No, but but Mr. Speaker, time, we know that. But, but just people that you really like, that are your friends, conservative Republicans, are no way want to vote for Ukraine aid. So does Speaker Johnson just get Democrats, a handful of Republicans, and pass it anyway? And if that does, in fact, happen, Marjorie Taylor Greene says she's going to look to recall him like what uh, what Matt Gaetz did to you. No, but what she's doing is much different than what Matt Gaetz did. Um, She didn't make it privileged, so it's not up for a vote. And the one thing I've always found about Marjorie is she's a very serious legislator that deals with (laughs) policy. And the best way to deal with anyone like that is sit down and talk to them. I don't believe the speaker has spoken to Marjorie. I think if you sit down and discuss, you understand you have Congress that you don't control all. You you have to find common ground in between. And that can be done. Those are two conservatives that can do it. All right. Well, there you go. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a very serious legislator the way that January Sixers were just very enthusiastic tourists, somebody wrote on Twitter. But she hasn't authored any legislation, not one piece that I'm familiar with. So that was a fun time. That was a fun joke. Uh, One thing I forgot to mention from headlines or in headlines is that the job numbers came out. The March data came out on Friday. U.S. employers added 303,000 jobs. In 39th straight month of growth, the March data increased confidence among economists and investors that robust hiring and rising wages can continue to coexist while inflation eases. But that didn't stop this conversation between disgraced hypocrite J.D. Vance, the Republican senator from Ohio and CNBC's and Fox Business's Maria Bartiromo, who downplayed the historically strong jobs market by pointing out that some of the jobs were going to immigrants. That Biden wants to flag wave about how well the economy is doing. You know, I've been home for the last two weeks, Maria. People just don't buy it. People recognize that it's getting harder to live your dreams under the Biden economy. And it's unfortunately because a lot of that net job growth has gone to the foreign war. What a disgraceful commentary uh, for the president to be bragging about an economy that's benefiting illegal immigrants more than American citizens. That is just astounding, Senator. <laughs> and, and all day Friday... We heard all this celebrating. All right. There you go. That happened on the television on Fox News. And now let's get to some more of the serious clips from serious people. Here is Caitlin Collins on CNN with a fact check on RFK Jr.'s claims and lies about January 6th. This is about almost two minutes and I think worth it as a reminder and just a good, pretty good fact check from CNN. Given the fact that Kennedy, who I should note, 13% of Americans right now say they would like to be the next commander in chief, is pushing these lies, we want to take a moment tonight to set the record straight. In his second attempt at a cleanup in as many days, and in response to a CNN request for comment, he's already retracting part of his claim that those same reasonable people tell him protesters carried no weapons. The truth is, folks like Guy Reffitt are serving time for bringing a gun onto Capitol grounds that day. 
or because court documents show that Christopher Alberts was arrested carrying a loaded pistol and 25 rounds of ammunition. There's also Mark Ibrahim, an off-duty agent for the DEA who was charged with bringing his service weapon on Capitol grounds. That's all before you get to the guy who was arrested with a pistol and a rifle who showed up too late for the riot, but had talked about killing Nancy Pelosi. Or the man who parked a truck with 11 homemade bombs, a handgun, and a rifle just two blocks away from the Capitol. In all, the Justice Department has said 122 people face charges connected with carrying weapons on that day. That includes guns, stun guns, knives, batons, baseball bats, flagpoles, and chemical sprays. RFK Jr.'s statement also claims that none of the rioters had plans to overthrow the government. Hmm. Even as more than a dozen members of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys have been convicted of or already pleaded guilty to sedition. And the idea that this is all politically motivated by the Biden administration completely ignores the fact that the prosecutions began almost immediately while Donald Trump was still in office. Okay, CNN's uh, Caitlin Collins with a fact check there. I thought that was pretty good. Wanted to share it with you. I've actually been impressed with her. I have been, uh, I was a critic of hers and I uh, think there's other people that were probably better at CNN, much less outside of CNN to do that primetime job at, I think it's nine o'clock PM, including my friend Laura Coates, but she's got her hour at 11 and is doing great. And Caitlin Collins, not too bad. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm going to go on a limb and say it. I really like Margaret Brennan at CBS Face the Nation in terms of the corporate news. I think she does a pretty good job, but probably the best of all the Sunday shows. And I thought this was interesting. She had Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland on, and he said he's not clear on the White House policy towards Israel's handling of the war in Gaza. The whole interview is worth listening to. I listened to the whole show while I was out enjoying the sun and doing some spring cleaning. And here it is. I want to pick up on this same topic we've been talking about um, in terms of the developing policy, because you have been pressing for the White House to uh, act act on the president's own standards for national security and to hold Israel to account in terms of possibly conditioning military aid. Were you clear on what the White House position is? I'm not clear. Uh, first of all, I should say I'm glad Bill Burns is in Cairo. I hope we get a ceasefire and a return of all the hostages. Um, I was glad to see the president, at least as reported out, uh, finally say to President Netanyahu that if you don't uh, follow uh, these, you know, my, my requests, that there will be consequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the president and the White House have yet to lay out what consequences they have and they, they want to impose. And we have had a situation where for months uh, the president has made requests to the Netanyahu government. They have ignored those requests and yeah. we've sent more 2000 pound bombs. We cannot revert back to that. We have to make sure that when the president requests something that we have a means to enforce it. All right. I thought that was really important. And I thought this was interesting, too. The mother of a 23 year old man being held by Hamas was also on Face the Nation. She said it's a failure of global leaders and governments involving involved in hostage negotiations, including the U.S., that has left her son and more than 130 others in captivity for six months. She also took uh, responsibility herself. It was a profoundly impactful interview. Her name is Rachel Goldberg, Poland. Her son, Hirsch, is being held by hostage by Hamas. And I want to share some of that with you. And I cannot imagine how painful the last six months have been for you. The 184 days that your son has been away from you. Um, but I know you've been on a mission. You met with the Pope. You've been to the U.N. You have been to the White House. And tomorrow you will be back at the White House. What are you expecting to hear? Well, you know, this is such a painful, staggeringly indescribable odyssey that we are on. And as you said, you can't imagine. I often say, oh, I also can't imagine what we're going through. And um, yes, we are going to be returning to Washington tomorrow um, to have meetings with different people in the administration. And we really want to understand what is happening to ensure that these people and remember, Margaret, we have eight American citizens who have been held for 184 days and we are feeling extreme desperation, despair and 
we've had wonderful access and sympathy and open doors and lots of hugs from everyone in the U.S. government. But this is a very binary situation. We want our people back, period. And that's what we're going to be talking tomorrow about is what is actually going to be happening, what leverage, what levers need to be pulled in order to make this happen, because six months is actually a complete failure on everybody's part. And I actually include myself in that as a parent, that I have not been able to save my son. And I don't know, I think that you're a parent, anyone who is a parent can can appreciate our job is to keep our children safe. And when they get in a situation when they're not safe, our job is to save them. And I feel that I have failed and I feel that our governments have failed and I feel that all the parties at the table have failed to get these 133 souls back home. All right. I thought that was a powerful moment and I wanted to share that with you. And also this, this is from ABC's This Week with Martha Raddatz hosting. She welcomed Jose Andres to the program and he called out what he believes is a rushed investigation into the Israeli drone strike, which killed seven of his world central kitchen aid workers. Powerful stuff from ABC's this week. Jose Andres, Chef Jose Andres now. Released Friday calling the drone strikes a grave mistake that should not have happened. Satisfied with that report? Well, I want to thank, obviously, the IDF uh, for doing such a quick investigation. But at the same time, I would say something so complicated, the investigation should be much more deeper. And I would say that the perpetrator cannot be investigating himself. But I would say we need more information. We need to see better quality videos. We need to be saying what was the conversations, the radio conversations between the different officers and soldiers in charge of saying that those cars were a target because they were an imminent threat. Those weapons can only be used with very sophisticated drones. And we all know that those drones have high capabilities day and night with cameras that can see in very powerful way what's going on. That's one of the things that they said is that they could not, because it was night, see the logo from World Central Kitchen, which was so clear on top of the vehicle. In the daytime, they said they couldn't see it at night. Do you buy that? Obviously, I would like to see high quality of the video, high quality of the images. I'm very sure that probably uh, those logos were visible. They were white cars. That logo is very colorful. Uh, even in a dark night, I guarantee you that those drones could be seen. They say that their drone video, and this has not been verified, this video, that they say shows Hamas operatives and they thought they one fired from an aid truck. Every time something happens, um, we cannot just be bringing Hamas into the question. I think IDF knows better than anybody that can be a better army. It should be protocols. It should be rules of engagement that somebody has to be making sure that they happen in a war zone. It's way too many cases now of humanitarians dying. Many civilians, women, children, that the only thing they did was trying to get close by to somewhere that they were giving them flour or bread. This is not anymore about the seven men and women of World Central Kitchen that perish on this unfortunate event. This is happening way for too long. All right. There you go. Chef Jose Andres, another powerful moment. And now it's time to have a little bit of fun, as I like to at the end of this very serious news segment. It's time for some comedy. Here is Colin Jost and Michael Che from Saturday Night Live this past weekend, Weekend Update. Weekend Update with Colin Jost and Michael Che. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Weekend Update. I'm Michael Che. I'm Colin Jost. Well, yesterday, everyone in New York pretended they felt an earthquake. (laughs) Just admit it, you thought it was wind. 
Yes. This earthquake was actually the best possible disaster. It was kind of like the time I saw my dad in the shower. <laughs> it was a little scary. There was no permanent damage, but I'm going to remember it for the rest of my life. <laughs> At a campaign rally, <laughs> former President Trump said he would debate President Biden anytime, any place. And then he pointed to an empty podium on the stage. And now Trump and Biden are both polling 80 points behind the podium. <laughs> In a new interview, Donald Trump also claimed that President Biden was high on cocaine during the State of the Union, what? saying he was all jacked up at the beginning. By the end, he was fading fast. Huh, it almost sounds like Donald Trump knows exactly what it feels like to be on cocaine. You know, like at the beginning, you've got a lot of energy. But then by the end, you're fading fast. Just recently heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat you. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump said at a rally that he would make November 5th Christian Visibility Day. Hmm. Wait, I thought that was called Ash Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the Florida Supreme Court has allowed the state's six week abortion ban to take effect. So now Florida's only remaining method for ending a pregnancy is roller coasters. <laughs> wow. Just today, Donald Trump posted on Truth Social that he wasn't scared of going to jail for violating a gag order, saying, I will gladly become a modern day Nelson Mandela. Mm. Unfortunately for Halloween. Oh, not a good luck, sir. Iowa's final four game against UConn was the most watched women's college basketball game ever with 14.2 million viewers, beating the previous record by 14.2 million viewers. <laughs> it was also reported Friday that the U.S. economy added over 300,000 jobs. Unfortunately, most of them are bridge fixer. Oh. Experts are saying that two different broods of cicadas will hatch this month, releasing trillions of cicadas into the U.S. And Biden is just letting them in. <laughs> <laughs> House Republicans have introduced a bill to rename Washington, D.C.'s Dulles Airport after Donald Trump. Because airports are a lot like Trump, a chaotic nightmare that turns you against your own family. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's enough from the boys at the weekend update. Always funny, in my opinion. Hopefully you appreciated that. Carlo, you're not mad at me. You could laugh at all those. You didn't have to see the visuals, did you? Come on, Carlo. Loosen up. You loved it. All right, that's for Carlo in Canada. Shout out. Now it's time to get to my guest, everybody. How about it? Let's get to it. This is the first time she's on the show. I really enjoy talking to her. I look forward to talking to her again. She is now a reporter in residence with the Omidyar Network. She is a contributor to MSNBC, a contributing column. She was a columnist at the Washington Post and Slate before that. He's the author of the critically acclaimed book, Hound Foolish, exposing the dark side of personal finance industry and co-authored the index card, why personal finance doesn't have to be so complicated. She co-wrote that with the, the great Harold Pollack, and I'm very excited to have her join me for the first time. You should read her piece in MSNBC that we talked about, about California's minimum wage increase for fast food workers, which started Monday, bumping pay up 25% to $20 from $16. We had a great conversation about that, debunking myths and more. I'm really excited to share with you my conversation for the first time with Helene Olin. Let's do it. All right. I just told you all about her and I'm very excited to have her joining me here for the first time. Very smart reporter, journalist, author, Helene Olin. Welcome to Stand Up. I am very impressed with your work, your career, and, and honored to be able to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Tell you've had a fascinating career. Tell us just a little bit about yourself before we get into some of the issues that you've been writing about recently and throughout your career, because you've you've transitioned into covering a lot of different things as a journalist, right? Uh, I guess so. OK, so these days I am a reporter in residence at the Omidyar Network. And before that, I spent six years as a columnist at the Washington Post opinion page, which is a great way of being able to write about whatever you want, because yeah. opinion columnists are expected to be Opinion columnists are expected to be experts at everything, but mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by sort of money, politics, 
how money intertwines with our personal lives. And I started doing that a uh, couple of decades ago for the LA Times when somebody called me up to ask me to sub in on a personal finance column. And as I always say, made the fatal error of telling me what it paid before actually figuring out if I knew anything about personal finance, to which I always say I knew exactly one thing about personal finance, which is if somebody offers you double your normal rate, you should immediately say yes. <laughs> That's, that is a really good tip, I think. <laughs> and uh, apparently I, I turned out I actually was good at it. Yeah. And, uh, couple of decades later, here we are. And by the way, that person is still one of my closest friends. Oh, that's so great. I guess, it I guess it wasn't a total disaster. Before we get to just a little bit about personal finance, I want to ask you one or two things there. I, I thought because you've been covering all these issues for such a long time and you've written for so many different media outlets and because we haven't talked before, I wonder if you have a theory on what it, or a way to frame what you've seen happen in American politics and culture. If there's any way to to talk about that, that you prefer to talk about, that you can identify what's really changed in in our lifetimes over the past 10, 15 years, even, or however you want to say you've covered it. You've seen a lot. What do you think has changed? Oh, it's, this is easy. Uh, my friends say I talk about this incessantly. Sure, great. It's, the, it's the inequality. I always say I grew up in a world that was extremely ethnically, racially, fill in the blank, stratified but was more economically within it because everybody lived. I grew up in New York City and people were in their little tribal neighborhoods. And so everybody, you know, there was more economic freedom within that, right? And now I wouldn't say it's fully the opposite, but the idea that like a doctor and a taxi driver would live in the same neighborhood is almost absurd. You don't even talk about it anymore. And I think that's the thing to me that has changed the most over my lifetime, over the past 30 years, over the past decade, is just inequality and how it's accelerated. And when I say inequality, I don't just mean salary, wage inequality, wealth inequality. And I think what we know from history is that periods of inequality tend to really drive people crazy. (laughs) And they... (laughs) Yeah. My husband says I always talk over when people laugh, Um, (laughs) is is that seriously, that people don't even totally understand, I think, what they're reacting to. I think people, it's not like people spend their days immersed in data, but I think over time, people with a lot of money tend to act in certain ways. They tend to be more closed off. They tend to be more oblivious. Um, We know this from various financial behavior studies. And conversely, people without it are reacting to this world in which you need to have it more and more. And people, as I said, don't even totally understand why they're acting in the ways they do, except we know that it tends to drive people literally insane and that periods of vast inequality tend to end pretty badly. Um, Hmm. You can I watched. So I was at the theater last night. I saw Uncle Vanya. Case closed. Right. Uh, Not everybody knows. Is that Chekhov? That's Chekhov. And it's he dies in 1904. So he doesn't really get to see the end of the world he was writing about. But he certainly understood that this way of living could not continue. Right. The only thing I would add to what you're saying, I think it's a great answer about what's changed and the answer being inequality and, and, and what drives people crazy. But I wonder, this is what I think. I think that people, everything you just said is true, but people have been given reasons and causes to blame right or wrong. I think I know what the answers are, but on the right, they're going to blame all these other catalysts. And because whatever Sean Hannity or Rush Limbaugh or Donald Trump, whatever, tell them is the reason for their financial situation, for their inequality. The reason you don't have this is because they gave it to somebody else that didn't deserve it. So I think people might understand that things are changing and things are more unfair, or unequal. Unfortunately, they've been told the wrong reasons. And so they're screaming and outraged and even rushing the Capitol and committing crimes and going to jail for things that didn't happen. And, and, and you see this period through history, too. One of my favorite examples is if you look at this is going to sound like a slight tangent, so bear with me. Sure, go if ahead. You look- History of the financial literacy movement, which is something everybody thinks is good, apparently, except me. I know, I'm uh, with you. That's why I laughed. I saw your piece in the Washington Post, one of your last pieces, about Dave Ramsey, and I dis- I despise that guy for my own personal reasons, but go ahead. Oh, oh we can talk. Can yeah, no, I, I, back, I think it's terrible. Yeah. Um, but anyway, in fact, if you look at the financial literacy movement, it goes through various phases. 
And one of the phases is the 1920s. And how does it end? It basically crash lands into the Great Depression. And even the people who are trying to pitch that at the time, a lot of it's coming through settlement houses and whatnot. And they're like, yeah, you can't teach people how to manage their money when they have no money, right? This is how the first round ends. And in fact, the second round of the financial literacy movement, which is what we've lived through now, starts in the mid-1990s, really, with Ford Motor Credit getting some bad publicity for, for issuing subprime loans, because as we all know, Henry Ford hated credit. And their response was to start teaching people how to, quote, responsibly use credit. And this is actually where it starts again. And so anyway, though, my point is that people will blame until they truly cannot. Right. So this is why you see stuff all the time like, oh, you you can just easily have money set aside if you just give up your five dollar a day latte, which begs the question of really are people. You is know, there a bigger are, lie told to people about how to save money than that one that you're spending too much on on coffee or something else like that? I, I don't know. It's very I mean, pernicious, it's, and it really part, ruins people's life. Like, you can enjoy your coffee. There's part, other ways. And it's part and parcel, by the way, of this whole idea that we're somehow this sort of loose, luxurious living people, and everything that happens to us is our own fault. It's this insane level of self-responsibility. And again, you see this creep in periods of vast inequality, where people will come to believe that they are responsible for stuff that they are frankly not responsible for. One of the best books ever written about this, and it's a university book, and I should, fair warning, it's slightly dry, is the Stanford sociologist Marianne Cooper a few years ago spent a lot of time with people in the Silicon Valley, from very wealthy people to people who were basically waiting on them, right? And what she found was is that the people actually with the most understanding of inequality and how it works were actually the wealthiest people. And all it did was make them double down on their kids' education because they wanted to make sure their kids were going to be okay. And then everybody else is like blaming themselves for their own financial woes, even when their financial woes are like, I was in a car accident and I didn't have health insurance, right? This is before Obamacare. Yeah. Uh, or I needed to buy food, go to the grocery store. So I had to put it on a credit card. Like what? Or I, how about this one? I don't know if you saw this news about where uh, Trump got his bond from, but I needed a car badly, but I had bad credit. And so I had to get one with a high interest rate. The guy, this guy Knight who gave Trump the $175 million bond, he made his fortune on, on high interest auto loans to poor people. Right. And if you don't think he wants something in a Trump second term, we're very naive, my list fellow listeners out yeah. there. Was Trump that book was, by Marianne Cooper? Was that uh, Cut Adrift? Families by and Cut Adrift, and I should have said the name. That's of okay. It. It's, a it book, it's a great book about cool. this. All of them. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you go ahead. And when it comes to inequality, I wonder if there's just I just want to spend on just another question on that. If you do blame catalysts and how much of its policy, how much of its culture, how much of its politics, because. I think I've been talking about inequality with economists and experts and journalists for a long time, and it's a huge conversation. But I think it's most interesting to talk about things like wage stagnation. But obviously, trade policy, rather tax policy to me, is as much as anything else. Uh, but you could talk about trade. You could talk about globalization. And you could just talk about greed as, as we can about the, what we're paying for now and when we get to the minimum wage conversation. But is there any policy uh, or catalyst that you blame more than others? Is there a list for the inequality? I think it, it all factors in, right? Sure. But I would say you probably at the end of the day have to look at tax policy right. because a- the real acceleration occurs with various and sundry tax cuts, right? In the 1950s, the highest marginal rate is around 90% and it, it starts coming down. And what eventually happens is people start the wealth gap builds up over time as this cuts back, especially post the age of Reagan. I think that's probably your main driver in the end because you can tax away a lot of wealth if you want to. To me, a slight digression again is one of the perfect examples is if I do a lot of writing on retirement policy and almost no one is aware that there's a thing called the social security tax cap where an amount, and of course, I'm not, I'm blanking on the exact amount that it is not taxed for Social Security. Isn't it 107? Uh, it's higher than that now. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, dividends are not taxed for Social Security. Capital gains are not taxed for Social Security. And <laughs> people are very <laughs> unaware of that. And when all these pundits are forever saying Social Security is going bankrupt and we need to cut it back, 
you almost never see them mention the tax component of it, which is that a lot of money is not being taxed for Social Security. A lot of money that people earn is not being taxed. In 2024, the limit was 168. I just looked it up quick. Right, I'm not sure if that's right. Thank you for that. I was thinking it was in the 160s. And I get either somewhere. way, that's the, the primary. It's interesting. That's the, the first thing that, that you would go to. It certainly is to me. I'm not positive what the answer is, but certainly that's one of the big ones, tax policy, and, and how that correlates with the inequality that you've measured and watched throughout your career. It's not always causation, but it certainly would be a primary driver that tax policy and how that has changed over our lifetimes alone has created and been the, the probably the primary driver. You don't see it in other countries as much as well. I think that's another good point. Right. And other countries, it's much harder to say move to another state to reduce your tax burden. Right. right? You, right. you can't be, say, Jeff Bezos and suddenly decide, I don't want to be in Washington state anymore. I'm going to go build a mansion in Florida. And not have to pay it's Washington also a, State. Isn't that a red herring? I feel like every time people make the argument, most people, not at the, the super wealthy, obviously, most people say, I don't want to pay property taxes. And so they move to a place like Florida and then they get shit services. Like the thing that you actually pay for in your taxes, like good schools and et cetera, right. like that costs something and you don't get it in places that don't have those ty- taxes. It seems like the trade offs aren't necessarily worth it for people of a certain income or wealth. Yeah, but that's not Jeff Bezos. Right? No, right. Sure, yeah, yeah. But it's a lot of people that are <laughs> making that argument. For you necessarily, but it is certainly worth it for him. And to be fair, state taxes are not what's really driving this, right? It's right. federal taxes. But that capital gains is taxed at much lower rates than income, a huge issue. There are arguments to be made for why capital gains isn't taxed at income at the same rate as income, and I understand them. But given how much people's wealth now, especially at the wealthier ends, comes from capital gains, comes from various forms of dividends. You have to start asking what's going on here and how do we deal with this as a country? The most vulnerable people are who you've written a lot about. Your recent piece at MSNBC, obviously, about the minimum wage in California going up. The sky is falling. The sky is always going to fall for business owners and capitalists and others when you raise the minimum wage. Talk a little bit about the history of the minimum wage in the U.S. or pick a state if you want, because it's a it's really so important. Well, the minimum wage goes back decades, right, to, to really to almost 100 years now where people were fighting for it. And the, from the beginning, we see these arguments over and over again that we're going to raise the rates and people are going to be thrown out of work. You always see this business And big money interests always have an argument. And they do this with other things, too. It's not just the minimum wage. It's any form of regulation. Oh, my God, sky (laughs) is falling. It's going to toss people out of work. We can't do this. And to me, one of the really fascinating parts about the minimum wage is that, and you really see it play out in this argument in California, where workers have now gotten in fast food or at $20 an hour as of this week, is the idea that workers are somehow responsible for their boss's fate. That if one of the things that came up in this is when these owners, when people who are against this complain about the minimum wage going up, they never say things like, and by the way, McDonald's raised the royalty rate that they're charging their franchise, the franchise owners last year. Like, why did they do that? Or they don't mention Prices on the food have been going up at fast food have been going up at double the rate of inflation for about a decade now. They don't mention the parts of this where the money is being taken out or rents are going up or food prices increasing. They don't mention the parts that aren't actually going to the workers, right? Somehow that's all just a given that McDonald's corporation is going to take their share of money. They don't mention the fact that stock buybacks were at over $6 billion last year among among the largest players in the fast food business. Wow. An amount, by the way, that would more than pay for the raise in California. <laughs> None of this stuff ever gets mentioned. <laughs> it always is somehow on the worker. Right. And right. like the worker is supposed to compensate the boss. It's this very strange way of thinking. And you see it play out over and over again. A, a story about me from a few years ago as I wrote a piece about vacations and why Americans don't take enough of time off. And why, of course, as a country, we barely get any time off. It's part of the reason. And this is true, by the way, most countries, like you have guaranteed time off from work. The United States, you do not, right? 
There's no guaranteed right to vacation here. And I was on an NPR radio show and somebody said, what about small businesses that can't afford to give their workers paid time off for vacation? To which my response was, if you're a small business and you can't afford to give your employees even a day off paid, like you don't actually have a viable business model here. Right. Like seriously, right? That's how close you are. And there, were, there was like the stunned silence. Nobody had ever thought of it that way before. And I was like, really? But this is the point, right? We're just so accustomed to this idea that like people who are earning minimum wage or a little bit more than minimum wage should be giving to big corporations instead of big corporations with billions of dollars in profits saying, okay, we can take a little less profit so that people can actually live semi-dignified financial lives. That's never going to happen unless it is the law. People aren't going to give. That's why the minimum wage is necessary. That's why it's... And also when you, you just have to say when we're looking at other countries... Whether it be paid leave, talk about parental leave, maternity, paternity leave. Obviously, we don't have that um, as a national law either. That's in, in many states. But I think the most important issue more than anything else is let's say I did get paid leave, but I didn't have health insurance. You don't want to stop working. Like it, it's just always needs to be factored. Just so if you want to say anything about that, I've been obviously banging that drum for well over a decade. And that separates America so much. That's why we are so not a great country. It's alone right there is that you have to always be worried about losing your health insurance. And thank God for Obamacare. I lost my job in corporate media. What was I without Obamacare? I would have never been able to start this independent venture. There would have been no way I would have spent everything I had just on health insurance for my family, which I had great benefits at a big corporate media company like Sirius XM. Medicare for I am a huge Medicare for all person. So I This is, I joke, when you leave the United States, you actually relax. Like, you notice people are more relaxed. For sure. I'm totally totally convinced one of the reasons for this is they're not petrified they're going to get fired, by the way, we're working well at this country for the most part. It's not, yeah, you're not as worried about getting fired as you are about losing your health insurance. You're not worried about losing your health insurance. Our unemployment pays much less than in other equivalent countries and so on going down the line. But I really feel the health insurance is a huge part of this. And Obamacare is wonderful, but it is more expensive than corporate health insurance for many people, unless you're eligible for subsidies. It has higher it, the level of benefit to the to what you pay. You generally corporate plans are more generous because they are because in many cases they're siphoning out some of the healthiest workers. Right. Because, you know, as a general rule, people who are, you know, some of the group, group in Obamacare are people who are at working for health reasons. And I think that's partly a factor here. Of course. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uncivilized and it's horrible. Like yeah. it shouldn't be allowed. Medicare for all. Yeah. Or at least remember, we all were forced to revisit the whole healthcare fight of 2010 when Joe Lieberman passed away the other day. And we're reminded that he single-handedly stood in the way of just a public option to compete with the private insurance, that's which isn't even Medicare, much less the buy-in at 55. That was just that one guy we were forced to... To recall, let's get back to California and the outrage over this new fast food minimum wage, hard to stomach. Helene, as well as anybody, when you raise, when you make, you have to pay workers more, that's why we automate them. We just, we're just going to get rid of them if we have to pay them so much and make them all robots and the automatic uh, cash registers that we all hate so much. At least I do. I'm not a fan either. I think we're automating already and we're automating whether a minimum wage is going up or not. Of course, why wouldn't you? If you could, you're going to. It's not how much you're paying the people. It's <laughs> if there it works. Was, there was that pundit who put up that picture from the, I think it was the Minneapolis airport last week, who said, this is what happens when the minimum wage goes up. And the minimum wage, those were put in before the minimum wage started really going up in Minneapolis, St. <laughs> yeah, Paul. Yeah. It was like, this has nothing to do with this. And you see it all over these, all over the place, these automated things now. Yeah. And it's going to continue and raising the minimum wage, possibly make it happen a little quicker, potentially. But it's not like they're going to not have them for the next hundred years if you don't raise the minimum wage. That's just not really realistic. It's true of every job, isn't it? If you can automate any job, whether it be the assembly line or the graphic designer that you have at your boutique ad firm with AI now, you're going to you're going to replace them. It's just capitalism. Hey, I came of age when I first started working. People still had secretaries. What? That's almost unheard of now. I right. mean, 
There are other arguments, obviously, against the minimum wage. You take on a few of them in your piece at MSNBC. But the, fa- the, the I think one thing that people haven't understood for a long time is people think that minimum wage jobs, because they might have been this way when they were younger or it's just their anecdotal observation, are for young people. They're for teenagers. They're for first jobs. But you have all the data in there that the vast majority of people working at these fast food restaurants are not, quote, teenagers. No, their majority are over 25. Majority are um, people of color. Majority in fast food in California are also women. And these are people, this is part of the reason why you start seeing other stats, like the fact that the most people who get food stamps are actually people who are working. And the reason they are getting them is because even when they're working, they're still not earning enough money, which is my other point, by the way, is this is a bill that is still being paid. And in fact, corporations are relying on taxpayers to subsidize them in a way you don't really think about much. Bernie yes. Sanders likes to make this point. A oh, lot. yes, and it's been well documented Yeah, they, that, that Walmart and all these other big companies right. that make billions and billions of dollars are being subsidized by the tax, taxpayer. And so semi, right. many ways, and there are people working full time, 40, 40 hours a week. And I want to be clear, because the argument back when you say this is you're demonizing people on food stamps. It's absolutely not. I totally support food stamps. And I think more people should probably be eligible for them. But the fact is you should also be able to pay people who are working 40 hours a week enough money so that they're not necessarily reliant on the government. People don't aspire to that. We have this myth in the United States, people aspire to like government benefits, which is just not true. Oh, so many myths about economics that have been so debunked over time, but it doesn't seem they they, see, they stay alive. They're all zombies. And just the right. simple idea that if, I think about this all the time, Helene, that this idea that so many people think, and they say it nonchalantly. I had a friend of mine recently say, a buddy of ours who went to high school with, he's so successful because he makes so much money. I'm like, is that success? Number one. And number two, he's so successful. He worked so hard. Is that right? Is that how you make a lot of money? You work really hard? It has something to do with it. But we learned today that every billionaire under 30 inherited their wealth. I just saw this big headline everybody's talking about today. But the the bottom line is it's luck, it's inheritance, it's opportunity. uh, And the hardest working people are, are the poorest people. By definition, they're the hardest working people. They have no time to do anything but work. But that's not the that's not the most pervasive theory. Obviously, it's that. They are that way because they are lazy. This sure sort of idea that like if you're working at a fast food restaurant, you're not working hard. <laughs> but somehow, they, by the way, they were deemed essential workers, right? All the laptop warriors got to stay home, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but these people are not working hard. Come on. These are the myths we tell ourselves, basically. I worked fast food when I was a young man. I worked at Walt Disney World at Epcot Center, and I worked 12-hour <laughs> days, and I couldn't feel my back at the end of the day. I was miserable. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and it, I, I will never forget it. It built a lot of character, and I. but it was chaotic. It was dramatic. It was stressful. It was physically exhausting, and people even at Disney World, weren't very, always very nice to you. <laughs> no, so I, I, mean, I will never forget that. No, it, it's really hard work. And the idea that it's somehow dismissed is really actually pretty offensive. Yeah, yeah. And it needs, and it's dismissed by people who, of course, are claiming to be champions of it. Don't raise the minimum wage, otherwise these people won't be able to work. And it's, but then why are you dismissing their work? There's so many more things I want to talk about that you've been writing about uh, your your whole career. But I, just, I do have to ask you just about the whole personal finance scam. You've written books about it. So I just and, and what do you want? What would you tell people just as a an entry point on this issue for those that don't pay that much attention or even more importantly, for those who, who might buy into some of these ideas and schemes? I mean, personal finance on one level, as Harold Pollack and I who wrote a book, is, is very simple. It can really be put on an index card, right? Yep. And it really boils down to the very obvious, don't spend more than you earn, except, of course, for many people, that's quite hard because we live in the United States and we have to do things like pay for our own health care, but invest very simply in index funds. If somebody claims they have the secret to how to beat the market or something or like how not to lose money, my favorite one is how not to lose money when the stock market goes down. To which my response is always, why are you telling me this? Do I look like Warren Buffett? If I had the secret, would I be telling me? Probably not, right? Use some common sense, basically. And the other part that Harold and I feel very strongly about is that 
government benefits are actually a part of your personal finance planning Mm. because minus government benefits, none of us are particularly secure. And it's wild when you look at the studies on this, the huge numbers of people will claim they've never taken a government benefit. But in fact, when you look at it, a lot of people have claimed mortgage deductions, unemployment benefits, ACA, healthcare subsidies. Sure. They've taken Medicare, right? Remember the infamous get my government's hands off my Medicare, my favorite. Mm-hmm. Almost all of us are actually quite reliant on government benefits to some extent or another. And many of them we pay into, just to be clear. And well. we yeah, yeah, and yeah. Yes, we pay into, to be fair. By yes. the way, I was so excited to see that you co-wrote that book with Harold. I met him through the healthcare stuff years ago, and he is not only one of the most brilliant people I've met, but he's also a very moral Good man. He's a very thoughtful guy and I like him very much. So he's one of the best people I know. He really and is. He's a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, I, I was like, wait, when I saw that you co wrote that book, I was like, is that the Harold Pollock? The one I know? It, and I was, it is yeah. the Harold Pollock. And yeah. I always feel like like I'm this little thing that like it's like Harold is good and I'm like, I can't believe we know that. Oh like, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you suffer he, with imposter he, syndrome. Like, he like thinks everybody is good, right? Harold yeah. thinks everybody is good. Yeah. I'm like no, these people who are fighting against the minimum wage are terrible. <laughs> well, yes, no, he's right, but that just means he's a better person than you. He's if you a think, person if you think is everybody is good, it's because you're so good. If you think, right. yeah, uh, not so much as we're not as good. No, uh, that's a it's a, a pernicious belief I think people have. But no, he's great, and so are you. And I'm really excited to talk to you for the first time. And I, I hope to talk to you very much more in the future. I'll get the books, read the books, and we'll talk about them and obviously uh, everything that you're writing and covering because it's very important. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me on. Absolutely, Helene Olin. I hope that you like that conversation, folks. She's a first timer, so it'd be great if you went over to Twitter where she's active and let her know that you appreciated her joining me and liked the conversation. Would love to have her back, though. Go do it. What are you waiting for? I just said though, by the way. I don't know if you picked up on that. I hope you did. Bumblebees. You bumblebees here at the end. I hope you like the Monday show. Looking forward to bringing you a whole bunch of great programming this and next week. I'm putting a lot into the program, the show, everything I can these next two weeks and hopefully won't have too many uh, other distractions and things. As always, let me know who you want to hear. And as always, I would ask you to do me the favor to go write a review on iTunes, Spotify, and also consider paying more for your subscription if you want. Or get friends to sign up. Tell your friends about the show, and hopefully they'll sign up to support it and become a member of our amazing, growing community, too. All right. See you on the Discord app. John Carroll taking us out. Go buy this song at johncarroll.org. Happy birthday to Pete Coe. Should have mentioned that before. And that's all. That's all I've got for you. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Love you guys. Be the change you want to see in the world. And stay mindful in the moment if you can. Okay. That's all. Bye-bye. Begin, they had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that he 
experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up, 